the surface that is truly evil. Tonight, a Dateline investigation. The Lacey Peterson story. I miss her smile and her laughter. I miss everything about her. It's more difficult to speak in public about it now. The news swept the T. Peterson, the meaning young mom to be. Please, please, let her come home to us. Tonight, almost 15 years later, exclusive new information. Prosecutors break their silence in their first extensive TV interview. You put so much of your life into it, it stays with you. Lacey's husband finally hear the story he told. His rarely seen police interrogation. You have no idea where We couldn't find anything wrong with this guy. He was that charming. And surprising details from the other woman who helped uncover the truth. It still affects me emotionally. Did Scott Peterson kill his wife? I do not believe it. I mean, really. Who else could have done it? Underhold. And this is Dateline. Here's Keith Morrison with The Lacey Peterson Story. Once upon a time in a small California city lived a sweet pregnant woman with a radiant smile and outside of friends and family, hardly anyone knew her name. She would never know, of course, how famous that name of hers was about to become. We have no indication, no significant leads at this point. Would never know that a curious, sympathetic, puzzled nation had cast an eye her way. Lacey Peterson. She was 27 years old. And she was gone. Lacey, if you're out there and can hear us and see us, we love you. And we're, we're searching, we're looking. It hit something, something in the air, the zeitgeist, that name, that smile, that mystery. Impossible to put down. Whoever has her, please, please, please let her go. Bring her back. You want her back? <laughs> please, let, her, let us have her back. And then there was him, the husband, the inscrutable Scott Peterson. I really don't care what people think of me, as long as it continues to keep Lacey's picture, description, tip line in the media. Before our very eyes, he would more from a faithful husband who loves suspicion and outrage. Such a circus the whole sad thing sometimes seemed to be. Scott! Hey, why don't you come and talk to us and tell us the truth? But for all the noise, all the breathless coverage, the hours of TV, the acres of tabloid, there was and is a story never completely told until tonight. A story that, for the first time, what do you think of Scott Peterson, his personality? He's a very unusual person. He's clearly very, he's, I think he's very smart. I think he thinks he's very smart. The story the detectives saw firsthand when somebody's in a position like him and they didn't do it, usually they'll say, take blood, take a polygraph, do that. He'd only go to a point. He was just cool as most. He was Steve McQueen cool. The story of what happened to her, too. The other woman whose name was also thrust into a cultural moment. Amber Fry. What does a psycho like that do to a person's life? Well, I'd say... I mean, from day one, it completely changed. Story told by a frustrated ex-journalist, convinced that the cops, the prosecutors, the public, got it all wrong. Did Scott Peterson kill his wife? I don't believe that. I do not believe it. And tonight, a video we found buried in the court archives. Tell me, Scott, that there's no... You have no idea... Scott Peterson talking to a detective just hours after sounding the alarm. Lacey was missing. But before we get there, we'll begin here with Lacey Peterson's mother, Sharon Rocha, surrounded, fortified really, by Lacey's best friends, Stacy Boyers, Lori Ellsworth, and Renee Tomlinson. They seem to make you feel cheerful. By the hair. <laughs> but it's tough still. It is tough. Perhaps harder than ever to talk about it, she said. To talk about her long-dead daughter, whose case so captivated the country. There are people 
growing up who probably either don't remember or never knew about Lacey Peterson. Tell me about Lacey. I moved to Modesto in the third grade, and she was one of the first people I met, and there was no not meeting her. You get the idea. Big personality. It just makes you want to whistle. <laughs> she made everybody laugh and welcome and just with a smile. She could smile and you would know that that is the girl that you're going to be probably spending the rest of the night talking to or maybe not talking so much, but <laughs> she was hard to get a word in edgewise. Talkative, smart, tenacious. Person who went for what she wanted, the way she did for Scott Peterson. How did Lacey meet Scott? At um, a cafe where Scott worked. Or at least saw him there and gave her her phone number to pass on to Scott. She wasn't that small. <laughs> and Lacey's mother liked Scott, liked him a lot. Very charming, very polite, perfect gentleman. Bring your roses, that sort of thing. Yes, he'd had a dozen roses for Lacey and then a dozen rose, roses for me. So, of course, I was impressed. The courtship was like that, old-fashioned. Asked our permission to marry Lacey, and we gave him our permission. There was a big wedding in the summer of 97, and by the turn of the millennium, Scott was a fertilizer salesman in Modesto, Lacey a substitute teacher. His job took him on the road a lot. But they were happy. Did the three of you get to know the two of them together much before? Good guy. I thought they were great. She was always happy. It was almost a joke of, gosh, does he have a brother? Though Lacey struggled to get pregnant, after nearly five years of marriage, that came too. The day after my baby shower that she threw for me, she took a pregnancy test and called everybody. Yep. Very early, very <laughs> early the next morning. Soon enough, the Petersons, they ready the nursery and decided to name him Connor. Lacey was nearly eight months pregnant by Christmas, the last Christmas before little Connor was due. You were supposed to have a uh, Christmas Eve dinner, is that right? Yes, I was. She was having Christmas Day, and I was having Christmas Eve dinner. That was when he called. It was close to 6.15, and he called and asked if Lacey was... But she's missing. And that was the beginning. Christmas Eve, 2002. Lacey Peterson, with her bright smile, was nowhere to be found. When we come back, the missing mom to be becomes national news. There's a $500,000 reward. I thought somebody kidnapped her. I was absolutely panicked. The first clues her neighbors robbed, her husband asking for help. Did he seem frantic or worried? A little bit.
it another way to get her picture out there. We hit the ground running. We just get up the next day, and I know I didn't sleep for days. Oakdale. Yeah, that's where I'm going to be. Pretty soon, the whole town of Modesto seemed to be looking for Lacey Peterson. Please have prayers. Anyone out there, help bring her home. Of course, the police were searching too, full out. How long did the search go on in here anyway? Well, all night, and then all the next day. Al Brocchini, the first detective of the case, watched as searchers scoured the area. They were everywhere here, right? They were just... Oh, yeah, they did a grid search, meaning they would have they would have been in eye contact and walked this whole area. Blur had a feeling from the start. Lacey Peterson, missing, wasn't going to end well. Because she didn't lead an at-risk lifestyle. She didn't hang around at the bars. She wasn't out two-timing him or doing anything like that. I mean, she was a girl that was just ecstatic from everything that I learned about her of being a mother. So she wasn't someone who would just walk away. And yet, in the anxiety and in the minds of those who love Lacey, that somehow this might turn out all right. We know we're going to find Lacey. We know we're going to bring her home alive and safe. We were going to find her. Like, I thought somebody kidnapped her. I, that's what I thought, just for the baby or something. Here's Lori, Renee, and Stacy, along with another friend. In January 2003. Yeah, there's a $500,000 reward for her. Just take that. You know, take the money and give us Lacey back. So, in those first days, an exhausted Sharon Rocha, her ex-husband, Lacey's father, Dennis, beside her, went on TV and pleaded with a kidnapper. I would just like to send a message out there that whoever has her, please, please, please let her go. Bring her back to we us. We so much. But the made kidnapping seemed plausible. Remember the couple's dog with the leash attached? Scott found it in the backyard. A neighbor said she saw the Peterson's dog wandering the street earlier that day, so maybe Lacey was kidnapped while walking the dog. And just about the time Lacey disappeared, there was a burglary right across the street. So, did she just take her? The police wanted to know. A reward for information uh, for the identity of the, uh, the person responsible for the burglary. Then, two men were caught. It didn't take long. And soon enough, one of them showed up in a TV interview. I went and picked up the safe and took a deal with it. I had nothing to do with uh, that age disappearance. And police agreed, no connection to Lacey. So they kept digging. We were also looking at and researching up all the sex registrants and the parolees. People with histories of violent crime, abductions, kidnappings, sexual assaults. And things a lot like of them hung out of the park. We had some, we were clearing those guys. We were interviewing them and we were verifying them. What we're not saying was that homicide detectives had other suspicions. Of course, they talked to Lacey's husband, Scott. We're certainly going to look at Scott first. He's the closest to Lacey, and that's where you start when you're working a case like this. That was behind the scenes. In front of the camera, the official police statements were more circumspect. Let's focus on the fact that we would still like to find Lacey alive. Possibilities are. The other possibilities are that she could be, uh, you know, a victim of foul play. Those closest to Lacey, who at first were having trouble grappling with the whole idea of foul play, certainly couldn't fathom that Scott had anything to do with Lacey's disappearance. Back then, early 2003, even Sharon Rocher told us, Imp no Scott and Lacey have no doubt whatsoever that he has nothing to do with her disappearance. It's a powerful thing, true belief. But when it comes crashing down, my, my, my. Coming up, Scott Peterson down at the station. A rare look at his interrogation. Oh, was a morning decision. Was there something fishy about his story? He didn't even know what he was fishing for. He didn't know what bait he was using. When Dateline continues. On to the Lacey Peterson story to go wide. That face was smiling out of magazines and television screens nationwide. The more we think we get, the more she's out there somewhere. Friends and family, desperate to get the story out. Talk to anyone, everyone.
but they noticed one person seemed to stay in the background. Scott, grieving in private. 2003. He's brave, but he's just devastated. He just would not be a good spokesperson. But there was one camera Scott couldn't shy away from. At the police station. Here's Scott with Detective Brocchini just hours after he reported Lacey missing in this rarely seen video. You can watch Scott hear his words. Frantic husband. You'll see. He answers your questions, but he doesn't do any more than that, right? 
Is that fair yeah. to say? He has an answer. Uh -huh. And uh, he doesn't elaborate, doesn't get emotional. Which the investigators thought at the time wasn't necessarily a good thing. He told me, oh, that's concerning. I get home and her car's there and the dogs run around the leash and, you know, the door's unlocked and, her, and that's, that's really concerning me, but let me take all my clothes off and wash them and let me, you know, eat some pizza and take a shower before I even try to figure out what's going on here. That's concerning. That was concerning to me. And then the detective asked the question that soon everyone would be asking. Most people in that situation, they're going to have a lot of questions for you. Sure. Well, are you guys doing this? I've heard of this. Why don't you do this? Well, we got that from Sharon. We got that from Ron. We got that from Lacey's friends. Everybody had an interest in, in trying to get us to go faster. Everybody, that is. But Scott. Now, why, they wondered. But coming up. Hey, beautiful. I just left a message at home. When I listened to that, I thought that he was leaving this recording for us to hear. Scott. Under scrutiny. I was afraid to say it out loud. Could he be involved with her disappearance? A week after Lacey Peterson disappeared, they had a vigil. Everyone coming together and praying just helps. Helps you feel like you're doing something. Candles and prayers and tears. And though much of Modesto was here in body or spirit, not a single person understood, not yet, not for a while, come, a defining moment. Especially, perhaps, Scott Peterson. Because, though it looked as if he might have shed a tear or two, he seemed to be avoiding Lacey's family and friends. What about the vigil? He wasn't, he wasn't on the stage. No, he wasn't on the stage. He was on the phone. Sharon wouldn't know for a long time the truth about Scott's phone call that night and the vigil that privately Sharon first allowed her mind to go to that very dark place. I remember it was New Year's Eve yeah. when I started going back and forth, but just to myself. I wouldn't say it out loud. I was afraid to say it out loud, but I started just kind of thinking, could he be involved with her disappearance? Sharon was a frantic mess, and she looked at him at somehow. Never once did he say, oh my God, where is Lacey? Where could she be? I hope she's okay. I hope, you know, she's not harmed. Never, you ever, ever. You were feeling that panic. Even as you talk about it, you can see a little bit of it left. Yes. He did not seem to no. have that sense. He did not have it. And I actually made out a list of did he or didn't he. I had a list. Didn't. And that's what really scared me. It scared her. She didn't want to believe it. Didn't want to go there. So she didn't put that thought out of her mind. But the detectives were trained to go there. They turned over everything Scott said and did and didn't do and wondered why. There was a slickness somehow, a fake feeling from the very beginning, they see. Well, he drove home to the Berkeley Marina. Hey, beautiful. I just left a message at home. When I listened to that, I thought, no, nah, this doesn't sound right. Been married five years, she's pregnant. And he's talking to her like they're on their third date. I live in Berkeley. I'll see you in a bit. We love you. Bye. The tone to it that he was leaving this recording for us to hear so that he would... And not somebody that was involved in foul play. Of course, it could also be that he was just a romantic guy. We couldn't rule that out at all. And there was this. Under the circumstances, the very day Lacey disappeared, why was he almost obsessively fastidious when they searched his pickup truck? He was worried about the wrong things. I'm searching his truck and into the land room. He was right up there. He goes, Al, he has a glove. I'll hold this or I'll move my truck. But, you know, I actually, I wrote it in my police report because I'm like, that's weird. These weren't hard facts of evidence. Of course, just a rising damp of suspicion. Things like, when does Scott get a boat? The detective said that, um, he said that he had taken his boat out. And I said, what, what boat? Boat. Mm -hmm. boat. Yeah. Until. It turned out. He did have a boat. Yeah. Yes. Scott had told Brokini that Lacey knew about the boat. How could it be that Sharon had no idea that Scott had recently bought a used 14-foot game fisher? 
the, the light didn't just go on my head and say, oh, he killed her. No, it didn't. I treated him like a husband and a mis the husband's suspicions. I asked him to take me to the boat, show me the boat. Very late that first night, the detective and Scott went to Scott's warehouse, where he worked and kept his boat. You came here that night, right? This evening, night, yeah. What did he tell you when you came here and you wanted to look inside and you had your flashlight out and stuff? He said there's no electricity. No lights, which was a lie. And open the door and I'll put my headlights in there. To the detectives, it all smelled bad. So they did the things detectives do. They got a wiretap on Scott's phone, hid a GPS under his car, and they watched him constantly. Sometimes they noticed he watched them too. I was surveilling him. I'm in an unmarked car. I'm parked three blocks away, I'm full of cars, and I'm watching this place with some binoculars. And all of a sudden, I look at my side view mirror, and Scott. So I got out of the car, and he, he says, uh, hey, Al. It was just odd, as was this 16 days after Lacey disappeared, when searchers in the bay found something. Sonar detected an object underwater that could be a body. Jared froze, hoping Lacey was alive. Listen to this recording from the wiretap on Scott's phone. You can hear Sharon's relief when she called to tell him it wasn't Lacey. I've got this mom. I just wanted to know it was a boat anchor. Of course, we knew it wasn't Lacey, but I just wanted to know. Um... That's Scott whistling in the background. He seems relieved, too. Like, like I just dodged that one. And, oh, my. Good. I'm glad it wasn't Lacey. But for us, with all the things that led up to that point, it was more like he felt lucky that... That really wasn't her, suggesting to us that we were looking in the right spot. And yet he seemed such a boy scout. He had no secret criminal past, no history of being abusive. You guys, you guys have had problems, uh, rare problems. So they stewed in their suspicion, aware they really had nothing on him. We couldn't find anything wrong with this guy. I don't think there was a warrant on his body. I don't think he ever had a traffic ticket. I mean, he really was the guy you want to marry your sister. We were waiting for that one thing that showed that he wasn't this perfect guy. In one remarkable moment, they get that and more. Coming up. He was single and looking for the one. Enter Amber. Hey, 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 hey. It was going really good. Did you start to think about, wait a minute, I can actually make a life with this man? You know, I, I did. When Dateline continues. October 2002. Months before Lacey Peterson disappeared. And a hundred miles away in Fresno, California, something happened that would make all the difference in the case. A young woman named Amber Fry got a phone call from a friend. Really well in getting my career started in massage therapy and single mother and was told about this great guy that that my friend wanted me to meet. He sounded perfect. She had said he had a good sense of humor, good looking, had a a career, he was single and looking for soulmate. You were serious about this? Yeah. His name? Scott Peterson. It was late November when they met in person, and it was electric. I mean, we just had a really great first date. Like, really good. Sometimes you meet somebody, it's very easy to talk to them. You feel as if there's no wall between the two. Right. It was like that? Yeah. He wooed her fast. It was early, bright, and exciting. Absolutely. He was eager to bond with Amber's little girl. He was really sweet with her. She was excited. We had planned a picnic and a little hike. She held both of her hands as we walked and was comfortable with them. It must have been very sweet at the time. It was. And it's not always you find a man who is comfortable with children. Right. He bought them both gifts. He brought groceries to their house. He made dinner. He was considerate, caring, even a voicemail. Hey, sweetheart, Sasha, call him on my feet. Drive into the gym here and do my weekly five-minute workout. See how you're doing. Um, I'll try to give you a call tomorrow. Bye. It was going really good. I was really excited. You leave the best messages. And, you know, looking forward to seeing you. Also perfect. What Scott never mentioned, of course, was 
that he was married. His wife was Lacey, and he and Lacey were readying a nursery for their firstborn who was on his way. No, Amber knew nothing of that. And yet, something wasn't sitting right with her, she thought. Why, when he called her, was her sick around? As if he was masking the sound of their conversation. It was just odd. Like, why are you talking to me in the shower? Yeah, he kind of blew it off. Like, it wasn't a big deal. But then, early December... He had called me one day saying he really needed to talk to me. And I could hear in his voice he was worried or concerned or something was going on. Scott was contrite. Said he had a confession to me. Because he had, wasn't honest with me. That I'd asked if he had ever been married. And, and uh, that, in fact, he had lost his wife. And this would be the first holidays without her. That's the expression he used, I lost my wife. Yes. And he was crying and just, you know, like, very emotional. It was a tender moment, said I felt compassion for him. I thought maybe she died of, you know, cancer or in an accident or, I mean, because obviously his, his words were obviously, you know, something recent or more yeah, recent. Sure. Did you ask? I didn't ask. I didn't want to pry because he was so emotional. With that secret on his chest, Scott gave her a new cell phone number where she could reach a trip to Europe over Christmas. That is... If you still want to talk to me after, you know... After because, I've told you this. Right. And so I was like, yes, of course. Did you start to think about, wait a minute, I can actually make a life with this man? You know, I, I did. And yet even here, December 14th, as they got ready for a Christmas party with Amber's friends, it was worming its way into her mind. I was starting to feel that women's intuition, something just wasn't right. Really? Yes. Well, he was in Europe, he told her. She should write to him at a post office box in Modesto. But he had told her he lived in Sacramento. So why Modesto? Why these odd questions she couldn't run? She called him. Could he check up on Scott Peterson from Sacramento? A few days later, her friend called back. He said that he found an article and that he was going to print it and bring it to me. I said, okay. That was December 29th. Scott had left for Europe two days earlier, or so he said. And then Amber read the article. Reading, because I, it sounds like him. Fertilizer salesman, Modesto. I don't think there was a full picture of him, but there was, uh, his truck was in this article. So were these words, pregnant and missing. I need this confirmed. I don't want to believe what I just read kind of turning your world upside down. Oh, yeah, there. absolutely. Police. I reach a dispatcher, and I said, I'm, I've been dating this person. Um, I just want to know if this is the same person. Sure. And she just kept saying, okay, okay. And like, okay, it is, or okay, what? I gave his birth date. I gave his full name. And, and then uh, she says, okay. And I said, okay, yes. She goes, yes. Yes, Amber Scott Peterson and the Scott were one and the same. And I just remember crying. Like, I don't know for how long I was shaking, like the adrenaline and just, I was in shock. Amber Fry, who thought maybe she'd met the one, was in the middle of something terrible. Coming up. Amber, we want to start recording calls. Hushings. Amber goes undercover. I tried to. I was shaking uncontrollably. It was so just nervous and scared. In all scrambling to manage that flood of tips about Lacey Peterson, Amber's phone call was a barely discernible ripple. Did they call you back right away? No. So the next day she called again. And, looking over the dispatcher's shoulder at just the right moment, was Detective Brocchini. I just happened to be standing behind um, one of them, and Bev was typing, and she said, Scott Peterson's my boyfriend. Oh, I'm, seeing all this I'm, I'm seeing this, so I said, Bev, are you talking to her? And yeah, I said, okay, let me talk to her. And before long, the two detectives were in Fresno listening in person to Amber's story of Scott's amorous courtship. It was almost like a scriptwriter was writing this, and... Uh, 
very talented with the romance he was. I basically just told him our been having and what our conversation was currently at the moment. And that he was over in Europe somewhere. Right. And, and they, you know, I think they too were just a little like in disbelief, shaking their head. No, he's definitely in Modesto. Scott had been lying the whole time, elaborately. He'd even called Amber from a payphone at the airport to say goodbye when she'd see the caller ID. But if Amber hadn't known where Scott really was, she sure knew a lot. And she had a mental recall that was punctuated with wine corks and all sorts of memorabilia that she'd saved, that she'd saved from their romance. So then the detectives asked, could she help them in their investigation? Well, we wanted to start recording calls. So they went right out and bought a portable recorder. And what do you know? As soon as I plug in her little recorder and I'm showing her push the red button, the black button, the phone rings. He called. Oh, boy. Hey, Hey, there. Take care of the game. And their expression is calling you right now. I was shaking uncontrollably. My fingers were like just sweaty, palmy mess. Yeah. And I was fumbling because I was so just nervous and scared. And so it began. For the next eight days, Scott Peterson, Amber Fry, pretending she was still his girlfriend. Bye. The cops, they kept looking. Bringing set dogs to Berkeley, divers to the bay. Lacey's friends held that vigil and prayed. And all the while, Amber secretly recorded her conversations with Scott, inwardly trembling. I was shaking and Joan, there was just too much nerves there. And I would pace back and forth. <laughs> One of those calls, of course she didn't know it at the time, was going to be notorious. New Year's Eve. That was the big one. Yeah. Amber, if you can hear me, it's New Year's. I know. I wish you could hear me. The Eiffel Tower, the New Year's Celebration, is unreal. That's a sick crowd. It's huge. In fact, the crowd was huge. It just wasn't in Paris. It was in Modesto. And they weren't celebrating. Scott called Amber from the vigil for Lacey. The one where he made himself scarce while Sharon and Lacey's friends pleaded for help. And Scott called Amber. It was like jogging on the cobblestones of Europe. I think I should just run on the street because these cobblestones are so green. He worked out the time difference for his phone calls. She could have been at nine. That's six o'clock my time. And he kept on wooing her, unaware of who was listening. No. 
not been traveling just the last couple of weeks. Why, I've got to lie to you that I've been traveling. Anyway, 
they break it on their terms. We believed at the time it was probably best to get her up there, almost like a sent two colleagues to fetch her with a statement all prepared. We were speeding back, in a sense, getting there. And, you know, having this statement written out, you know, trying to read it a few times so it's not too foreign. As they drove to Modesto, headquarters gathered the media. Big news, you come. And uh, we are waiting for Modesto police to come out any moment and speak on Chen. And this is the moment. When Amber Fry burst like a deer in headlights onto the public stage. Okay, first of all, I met Scott Peterson November 20th, 2002. I was introduced to him. I was told he was unmarried. Scott told me he was not married. We did have a romantic relationship. Panic attack, I couldn't breathe. I literally could not catch my breath. When I discovered he was involved in the disappearance, the... Lucy Peterson disappearance case, I immediately contacted the Modesto Police Department. She spoke for just over a minute. I am very sorry for Lucy's family and the, cost, the pain that this has caused them her safe return as well. And now everyone knew, and Scott knew everyone knew. So did he stop calling Amber Fry? No. Listen to this. Well, I would just say how brave you are. I'm really glad that you you did that. Um, it wasn't a matter of choice. What's that? It really wasn't a matter of choice, though. It I know, but still, it's incredibly brave. It just shows what amazing character you have. Scott called to congratulate her, to thank her. Very strange. The police were thanking Amber, too. Now they had new clues. Like the day Scott told Amber he lost his wife. It was the very same day he bought the boat. Coincidence police had to be evidence of premeditation. The very existence of Amber Fry changed everything and revealed that many little beasts of doubt had been churning about in the minds of even Scott's diehard supporters. After Amber came forward, that's when they started to open up about the things that they had been kind of hiding and holding back. Like how Scott once told someone he was hoping for infertility, that he seemed uncomfortable holding babies, that he didn't want to touch Lacey's pregnant stomach, that he complained he was having a midlife crisis at age 30. Now when people thought about his story that Lacey walked her dog, they remembered she'd been too tired to do that. And they remembered too the peculiar way he acted the night Lacey disappeared. I asked if he had called his parents. He said no. I was trying to have a conversation with him and he continued to just turn away from me. He would never look me in the eye. I had to keep following him around trying to have visual contact with him. Because Scott Peterson had something to hide. Coming up, they had a romantic relationship that was inappropriate. But in private, strange behavior. He said, I think we should get the house up on the market. Suspicious clues. It looked like five of these little coffee can anchors had been made. Tuesday is the um, State of the Union address. 
Okay. So that will take up, you know, a lot of you know, time. Well, um, okay, that's, you know. And I want maximum coverage. He got it, all right. A sudden whirl of interviews. A few days after his affair with Amber was revealed, Scott talked about it on NBC's Bay Area station. Obviously, he shipped that was inappropriate and unfair to a lot of people. In an appearance on CBS's KOVR, Scott claimed Lacey knew. I told Lacey about the, the relationship. Um, she knew about it as an important between us. Then he went on ABC to assure the whole country he was innocent. Did you murder your wife? No, no. I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And now many of the people who knew Scott and loved Scott no longer believed a word he said. For the police, who'd never believed him, Amber Fry was just one part of an intricate and entirely circumstantial case against Scott. It relied on the smallest of details, like this outtake from his interview with KOVR. Amber came forward. Let me turn that on. Yeah, what is that? That's my phone, unfortunately. Okay. This. Well, it seems strange his phone's ringing. And he's not stopping the interview to go and, and answer it. Now, this could be the call that's bringing Lacey back to him. It could be the ransom call. Um, it could be us calling him and saying, hey, we've got some good news for you that we found her. He went over there and just shut the phone off and resumed the interview without didn't checking see. to see what it was. Strands of evidence that tried to weave into a rope with which to hang Scott. Another strand? Scott's sudden desire to sell his and Lacey's home just weeks after she went missing. He said, I think we should get the house up on the market. And my mom said, this isn't the time to be discussing this, Scott. But he did sell Lacey's car. And then there was the cement dust at Scott's warehouse. A lot of people use concrete anchors for small sure. boats. And it looked like five of these little coffee can anchors had been made there on that trailer. But only this one anchor was found. It's clear there was more than one. Now, where are those? Nobody knows. Were the other four used to weigh down? Though Scott said going fishing was a last-minute decision. There were sea charts and maps of the Berkeley Marina on his computer from early December. And Scott told police he spent time at his warehouse office on the day Lacey disappeared. They couldn't help but notice how secluded the place was. I said, very isolated back here, and especially on a Christmas Eve. If you wanted to get away, it was the place you could do it. Yep. Like move a body into a boat, thought the detective. We have a, uh, a window here in the front that notes that the screen is uh, a jar. So police gathered the strands, spun the rope. And everything that happened, happened with a lot of people watching. Like in mid-February, when the cops were... That was great. We were inside when we're, we're doing the search and all the media is out here and we're watching ourselves on TV. Where does Scott Peterson stand in all of this? He's not been eliminated from the investigation, nor has he been uh, identified as a suspect. Not identified as a suspect, not officially, yet clearly the only person of interest for the cops and the media. And Sharon kept grappling with the depressing truth that she just didn't want to believe. I felt that I should have felt her leave this earth. I brought her into this world I should have felt when she left so that I would have known whether she was gone or not. So that, that she was coming home. It's a strange and powerful thing though, isn't it? It is. You give birth to a person, you bring them up, and you feed them care for them but... and we were very 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 close yes. and scott he soon faded from public view didn't stay much in modesto on february 19th which happened to be the same day the cop finally told him to stop calling her i think right now for me scott um and, and really everything that has happened in the last 50 plus days for myself and and the family and you and Everything that's going in right now, I think it'd be best if you and I didn't talk anymore until there's resolution in this. Good. And everyone just waited until the sea finally revealed what everybody had been waiting for. Coming up. I felt something that day. I just knew. 
a devastating discovery, and a ride into danger. This was completely off the charts. Nobody's ever... Dateline continues. April 13th, 2003. It was a cool day in Northern California. Sharon Rocha was hiding from the world. It was one of those days I just buried it, and I had all the drapes drawn because I just knew. I felt something that day. I knew something was happening. She had so locked herself away that day that friends had to come to her house to tell her there was news. They're knocking on my back door on the slider in the backyard. And it's like, how did they even get into the backyard? Well, they were trying to, of course, reach me to tell me. It had been nearly four months. Somehow, Sharon felt more bad news was coming. Early that morning, when the tides were low, the body of a baby had been found on the shoreline north of Berkeley. The next day, another body, a torso, badly decomposed, was found nearby. Contra Costa County Coroner has arrived at the scene and has now recovered the remains of the victim. With this time, letting people know of the victim is female. But even without positive identification, everyone knew. Even Sharon, who, despite everything, kept trying to hold on to a shred of hope that she'd wake from a nightmare. From Scott, it was not a peep. The fact that he didn't pick up the phone and call anybody to find out if that was his wife and left no doubt in my mind. Her daughter was dead. Her grandson would never be born. Detective John Bueller had known that for a while, and now he was nearly ready to arrest Scott, just not quite. We were going to wait to serve the warrant until after the DNA results were released to confirm the bodies of Bert, Lacey, and Connor. By that April, Scott was parents. So, tick, tick, tick. Detectives waited for lab results. Police kept an eye on Scott. They had the surveillance going on him for quite some time before that. Then, April 18, 2003, at 7 a.m., the lab results were still pending when Scott Peterson decided to play cat and mouse with the driver. At least he was. He knew we were behind him. Scott started driving erratically, very fast. We were trying to keep this rolling surveillance on him. We had a helicopter for part of the time. He stopped and started. He'd cross over three lanes of traffic and take an exit ramp. And of course we couldn't do that. We'd end up missing him. Driving evasively at times, giving one cop the finger. How long did they leave you on this very chase? I like it might have been a couple hours or so, maybe longer. Scott, with police trailing, traveled 160 miles that morning. Until law enforcement decided it was just too dangerous. We have to arrest him. They put the lights on him, and he pulled off into the entrance to Torrey Pines Golf Course. And they made contact with him as we pulled up, came out of the car, put the handcuffs on him. No hysteria. Typical, you know, Scott in all his uh, control, you know, demeanor. What they found in the car with Scott was fascinating. Camping gear, four cell phones, his sister's credit card, his brother's driver's license, and cash. Almost $15,000 in, in cash. cash. He also looked different, way different. By intent, did he express anything that would su suggest he understood? So that was it. He was going away. I went to search his car. He said, uh, John, can you tell me if those bodies were my wife and son? And I just told him, I said, Scott, you already know the answer to that. As they drove north of Modesto with their prisoner in the back seat, Bueller got confirmation that the DNA was in. The bodies were Connor and Lacey. No, he's wearing sunglasses at the time of looking. I can't, he doesn't make hardly any reaction whatsoever. And just a few minutes later, they stopped by a roadside burger place to get something to eat. Given the news he'd just received, Mueller assumed Scott wouldn't have much of an appetite. He was wrong. And he goes, I'll have a double-double with cheese, a small fry, and a vanilla shake. Cold. That's what Mueller thought. I've run into people that have had grief before many, many times. And this was completely off the charts. Nobody's ever reacted this way in my presence when it came to something like that. When they got back to Modesto, Scott was booked into jail. It seemed like the end of the road for Scott Peterson. But the circus was just moving up the road a bit. Coming up. He can be very smooth. 
but there's something underneath the surface. Prosecutors speak out in their first in-depth television interview. He wanted a different life. The story it's taken nearly 15 years to share. Is that correct, Mr. Peterson? You're pleading not guilty of two charges of uh, murder plus the special, uh, denying the special allegations? That's, that's correct, Your Honor. I didn't say. As the case against Scott Peterson slowly made its way from arrest to trial, what really happened to Lacey Peterson became a kind of televised courtroom theater Western for up to five months. The jury's going to hear a lot of theories, and they simply must latch on to the one that is most reasonable. Jurors who are death qualified are more likely to vote for conviction. The cast included legal celebrities like defense attorney Mark Garagos, who signed on to defend Scott Peterson. Scott looks forward to finding out who did this to his wife and to his uh, child. Thank you for coming today. I'm attorney Gloria Allred. To my right is Amber Fry. Gloria Allred, who erected a protective wall around the story's wild card, Amber Fry. Amber was not going to be doing any interviews during the course of the case, even though so many people wanted to sure. interview yeah. her. Wasn't she offered immense amounts of money to do covers and things like that? There were. She would only provide an interview. But she needed to protect her testimony for the actual case. But altogether missing in the legal cacophony were the prosecutors. Birgit Flatiger and Dave Harris. This, all these years later, is their first and only in-depth television interview about the Peterson case. Back then, the op- Your radio would go off in the morning, the radio alarm, and the little news blurb that you would hear first on the radio. pop radio station, whatever, would, would reference the case. They could say whatever they wanted, right? And it wasn't always necessarily true. In court, Garagos want a change of venue, though just 90 miles or so from Modesto, did anyone not know about the Peterson case? He just wants a trial to take place so that people will be able to see what really took place. Scott's mom assured reporters her son was innocent, but she couldn't have been very happy when everyone decapped to the new courthouse and saw this billboard a local radio station bought right across the street. Man or monster? What did you think when you saw that? Well, that was when we First day of jury yeah. selection. So I, I think we were worried we were going to have another change of venue. But here it stayed. Opening statements get underway today in the trial of Scott Peterson, accused of killing his wife Lacey and their unborn son. June 1st, 2004, a year and a half after Lacey Peterson vanished, her husband Scott went on trial for her murder. And right off the bat, the prosecutor Amber, he winced as they showed these photos of the two of them from the night of the party, the same photos that helped him get caught. And then they showed the jury this picture of Lacey. Same night, different party. She went alone. The reason for the murder was he didn't want to be married anymore. He didn't want to have a child. He wanted a different life. And him of that, he didn't want what he had. And he wanted to be rid of what he had. He did. One way or another. Lacey and Connor were responsibilities and he didn't want that he doesn't care about anyone but himself he can be very smooth but there's something underneath the surface that is truly evil so said the prosecuted Lacey on Christmas Eve early in the morning or possibly the night before and then after that after he had done that drag her from the bedroom out to the carport pickup truck backed into the carport take her out the side door, wrapped up most likely, load her into the bed of the truck, drive over to the warehouse, move her to the boat, cover the boat. While putting together a woodworking tool, law enforcement believed, he headed to the bay. But evidence of murder? That was all circumstantial. They had no incriminating DNA, minimal forensics, just all those little strands. And in fact, it didn't always go well for the prosecution as Garagos worked to keep them off balance. We would try and present witnesses as to our theory of the case, and they were very good at disrupting that and saying, we're not ready for that witness. Or that. Just trying to throw a monkey wrench into your smooth telling of the story. Yeah. If, if it happened once, maybe it was just coincidence. If it happened every single week, at some point in time, it's a plan. It got worse for the prosecution. 
Caragos, who believed the Modesto PD had it out for his client, Keeney had hidden evidence. He asked him on the stand, Did you delete information from a police report about Lacey visiting Scott's warehouse December 23rd? The answer was, I did. And then, okay, we're done for the day. That's like, uh, you know, can I answer? Uh, and that was a very good point for him to make because it would create the impression that, in fact, Lacey did know about the boat and stability to the rest of the story as a result. Well, maybe, maybe not, but he could have got the whole story. Of course, the whole story wasn't what the defense attorney wanted, that the information was in another cop's report, that nothing had been hidden. But what did the jury think? What was your sense of how well that prosecution was going? I was a bit concerned that their burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt uh, had not yet been met. But the big change, the sea change, was the day she walked in. Walking in the courtroom, <laughs> you could hear body shifting towards the door. Uh, a lot of pressure. As got everything from strawberries and champagne on their first date to his tearful confession of losing his wife weeks before she went missing. How did you lose her then, before she was lost? Explain that. And all those phone calls were played for the jury. The jury could hear his words, of course, not his words under oath, but his words on the phone call, and how he lied and lied and lied and even lied about lying. Mark Aragos did what he could. He went after Amber repeatedly, questioned her about how much she had to drink on her dates with Scott, and about how often she and Scott had sex, and how soon. Did the defense rattle you? No. He tried. Amber didn't buckle hide. An expert told the jury the baby died between December 23rd and December 25th. Another expert told the jury that Lacey's decomposition was consistent with three to six months in the water. And a search dog handler testified her dog picked up Lacey's scent at the Berkeley Marina. And said the prosecutors, it was obvious Scott Peterson knew Lacey and Connor were gone for good into a storage room. Put office furniture and pillows and a locking device from a car in there. Scott wasn't expecting Connor to ever come home. Coming up, his lying cheat. Yes, he was. A cheater. A liar. But a killer? I mean, really. Well, when Dateline continues. Four months into the trial, the defense got its chance to disprove the prosecution theory. We wanted to talk to attorney Mark Garifuss about the trial. He didn't respond to our request, but he wasn't interested. Turned us down, said his family, because he didn't like my coverage of the case back in 2003. Scott's frantic story, simple yet utterly baffling, was this. His family still insists he's an innocent man, and we wanted to hear that from them. They turned us down too, and suggested we talk to a retired journalist who shares their point of view and said the prosecution theory of the case makes no sense. Because it was so ridiculous. Scott Peterson kills his 160-pound wife, puts her body in the back of his truck. He then drives it to his office to pick up the boat. And that dead body of his wife in a parking lot, he goes back into the office, spends an hour on the internet, sending Christmas email to his boss, and then he said, oh, well, I guess I better get rid of the body now. Cole believes that media coverage biased against the defendant, somehow, this gigantic tsunami of media coverage, much of it false, much of it totally distorted, uh, concentrating on things that had nothing to do with the evidence. And that basically, I think, consumed that little fact trial inside the courthouse. God, he said, didn't see anything really related to a murder. But nonetheless, 
forever tainted scarred in the eyes of the public and the jury. Once you started looking at that case through an amber lens, everything he did was wrong. Because he's a lying cheat. Yes, he was. The affair with Amber, said Cole, made everything Scott did look sinister. Scott Peterson was behaving pretty oddly. His behavior does look odd. He backed in himself into a horrible position. Sure. He's thinking, if anyone ever finds out about this woman, not only will it look bad for me, but that will become what this story is about. And he was exactly right. So he very, very well tried to keep her at bay with lies, thinking Lacey will be home next week. And that would explain why Scott hid from TV cameras, not guilt about Lacey, guilt about Amber. In Cole's mind, Scott acted like a man who'd expected his wife to come home. So that, said Cole, is why Scott didn't want a ding on the car door when the cops were searching his treadmill. He did sell the car because, you know, he, he was not rich. The Peterson family isn't rich. And Scott hemmed and hawed about what he was fishing for, said Cole, because the whole point of the trip was not so much to catch something as it was to test the boat before giving it to Lacey's stepdad, Ron Gransky, as a Christmas present. The boat was basically a kind of a gift, and that was a Christmas thing. All innocent, said Cole. But why did Scott tell Amber? Before Lacey vanished, I lost my wife. Amber confronts Scott about having a wife, and he says, I lost her, and this will be my first Christmas without her. Yeah, Scott had had that line used on him by a woman who was married, mm -hmm. and uh, he asked her if she was, uh, I lost my husband, and Scott decided that he liked that, and that was a really good line. In other words, Scott was a cad, not a killer. So said Cole, anyway. But then how to explain the strange similarities between Scott's fishing story and the circumstances of the murder? But you know, he went fishing in the bay. Yep. They found the bodies in the bay. Yes. Got it. I'm glad you asked that question. Let's remember the scene. She disappears. Within a few days, Scott's I went fishing in Berkeley story is all over the media. So, the real bad guys, maybe local sex offenders, or the two men arrested for the burglary across the and framed Scott that way. That's Cole's theory anyway. Made more sense, he said, than the case against Scott. So, what really happened on that cold December morning? Twelve people would decide. Members of the jury, you have heard all the evidence and the arguments of the attorneys. And now it is my duty to instruct you on the law that applies to this case. While the jury went off to deliberate, one day, two, a week they stayed out, and nobody knew. What were they thinking? Coming up, a legacy. She's in heaven, and she's in our hearts. A lesson. That gut feeling. More women need to listen to that. A life in the jury's hands. Excuse me out. Nearly two years after Lacey disappeared, after nine days of deliberation, the jury in the Scott Peterson trial finally announced... It was pretty exciting and terrifying. As the crowds gathered out front, the reporters got into position, and everyone flooded back into the courtroom. What is it like for your level of anxiety? I felt like I was going to explode. The verdict is being read right now in a California courtroom in the double murder case against Scott Peterson. There is no camera in the courtroom, but an audio, live audio feed. The above entitled cause, find the defendant Scott Lee Peterson guilty of the crime of murder of Lacey Denise Peterson. Finally, the words Sharon and all those who loved Lacey had been waiting for. Guilty of Lacey's murder and... Guilty of the crime of murder of baby Connor Peterson. Outside the courthouse, crowds cheered. I, know, I remember I just burst into tears. Everything just comes gushing out. It's just two years of anxiety, of waiting. A month later, the jury decided Scott's fate. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, fixed the penalty at death. 
Now, Scott sits on death row at San Quentin. Irony to his residents here. If he had a window, he could look out on the bay where he launched his boat and what was in it that Christmas Eve in 2002. It's not likely he'll be put to death anytime soon. California hasn't executed anyone for more than a decade. And nearly 15 years after he sounded the alarm that his wife was missing, Scott waits on his appeal and his family has been working with a filmmaker on a documentary they believe will show Scott got a raw deal. Sharon Rocha knows she has no control of any appeal or film. She tries not to think about that or her ex-son-in-law. I really don't give much thought to him. It's rare. But she does at that most painful time when Lacey was just missing and she didn't know the truth. So she's become part of this sisterhood. When Natalie Holloway disappeared, Sharon called her mom. More recently, she, with Stacy's help, has reached out to other families whose cases haven't gotten any attention. We'll use Lacey to help get their stories out there. Absolutely. Right. To their, their cases. You can find more about the people Sharon and Stacy are trying to help on our website. No one has survived untouched. Amber Fry's life certainly never returned to what it was. But if anything, she told us, the whole strange experience made her stronger, her beliefs stronger. I believe her in Jesus Christ. And I believe truly in my heart that God prepared my life for this. And she's determined to teach her own daughter something she wished she'd understood better when she met Scott. We all have heard the expression, women's intuition, that gut feeling. Because it's so easy for, I will say, a man to say you're crazy. Like, you're being paranoid. Sharon Rocha wishes she had had some sort of gut feeling in late December 2002 when she and Lacey were looking forward to the new baby. The lives full of hope back then. Back in those innocent days, before the rest of us heard the name Lisa, I'd smile. It does make you question yourself. Um, you no longer trust your instinct yeah. or what you think you know about people or who you know or how you know them. Lacey's mother, her friends, their lives never really returned to normal. How could they? But they've adapted like humans do. <laughs> Stacy, Lori, and Renee, and those children who never met Lacey know her in a way. She's they a part of our lives. I mean, she is a part of our life still, so that means our children need to know about that part of our life. She's special and she had a baby. So the cemetery isn't a place of sadness for them, usually. I love it because my boys 